The future of America depends on children receiving an education that develops the full potential of the individual through academic knowledge coupled with a proper understanding of the human person. Unfortunately, the education reforms of the past 50 years, ending in what we now call Common Core, have put us in a complete shift away from traditional academic materials and values of previously successful generations. Historically, knowledge has been conveyed through amassing facts, using the building blocks of language, beginning with phonics, studying classical literature, mastering sequential math, following scientific reasoning, and studying history. But today, this is not the case in American public schools. Many blame this on Common Core, but I'm here to tell you that the story starts about a hundred years earlier. Common Core is just the latest in a string of education reforms beginning in 1906 with the book The Principles of Teaching Based on Psychology, written by Edward Thorndike. These reforms were brought to the education field by behavioral psychologists in order for schools to condition children to behave and think in certain ways. These methods were focused on the socialization of the child rather than academics and the intellect. Development of individual abilities and potential would give way to social conformity of the conditioned child. The founder of experimental psychology, Wilhelm Wundt, was born in Germany in 1832. He focused mainly on studying the brain and central nervous system. He redefined psychology as having to do with the body rather than the immaterial soul, and he also worked to redefine education. Originally, education meant the drawing out of a person's talents and abilities by imparting the knowledge of languages, scientific reasoning, literature, history, and rhetoric. To an experimental psychologist such as Bunt, education became the process of exposing the students to what they called meaningful experiences to ensure desired reactions. I could go into more depth on Wundt's influence, but for the sake of time, I will only scratch the surface. Wundt taught a man by the name of Raymond Cattell, who was a believer and advocate for eugenics and selective breeding. He held a position at New York Columbia University was president of the American Psychologist Association and the National Academy of Sciences. He also invented the sight reading method, which has replaced phonics, resulting in lower literacy rates, as we see with Common Core. He discovered that preventing fluent reading could impair logical thought. Another student of Wundt's, Edward Thorndike, spent 30 years at Columbia University's Teachers College and said that every child should have as much high school work as the common good requires. The last student I will mention was G. Stanley Hall, who organized the Johns Hopkins University Psychology Lab where he taught and influenced John Dewey. John Dewey, known as the father of modern education, published the first American textbook on his new psychology and was permitted by Johns Hopkins to apply his experiments to education in 1895. He taught at the universities of Michigan and Minnesota, the University of Chicago, and Columbia's Teachers College in New York. Dewey was an avowed socialist and co-author of the Humanist Manifesto. He was quoted as saying, you can't make socialists out of individuals. Children who know how to think for themselves spoil the harmony of the collective society. Free market economist Friedrich Hayek backs up this quote by Dewey in his book, The Road to Serfdom. He says, the tyrant will be able to obtain the support of all the docile and gullible who have no strong convictions of their own but are prepared to accept a ready-made system of values if it is only drummed into their ears sufficiently, loudly, and frequently. It will be those whose vague and imperfectly formed ideas are easily swayed, and whose passions and emotions are readily aroused, who will thus swell the ranks of the totalitarian party. Psychologists Cattell, Thorndike, and Dewey began what would be known as progressive education and would soon be in every major city in the country. To these experimental psychologists, education became not the drawing out of a person's potential through knowledge, 
but the measured process of exposing students to certain emotional experiences to ensure desired reactions to shape attitudes and beliefs. Voon's followers established themselves at Princeton, Johns Hopkins, Wesleyan, New York University, University of Cincinnati, Yale, University of Chicago, and Columbia University's Teachers College. By 1953, the Teachers College had produced approximately 20% of all public school teachers, with 50,000 having been trained at Teachers College. In the aftermath of World War II, Columbia University's Teachers College assisted in the creation of UNESCO, the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization. In 1952, UNESCO circulated a pamphlet that states, as long as the child breathes the poisoned air of nationalism, education in world-mindedness can only produce precarious results. The school should therefore use the means described earlier to combat family attitudes. I mean, come on. When I was in high school, the vast majority of students remained silent during the Pledge of Allegiance. You can see that our young people today have a very anti-American attitude, and that attitude is a direct result from what they are learning and not learning in American public schools. In 2016, the James Madison Institute did a study on how 18 to 25 year olds voted in the 2016 presidential election, and the results were shocking. All but five states were blue, the reason we should be concerned is because many of these young people favored Bernie Sanders, who was the first candidate in American history to run openly as a socialist. This reflects what's being taught in our schools across the country. Textbooks have been pushing progressive ideas in schools for years, and I can attest to that because I'm a product of the public school system. We were taught that socialism is fair and capitalism is essentially evil. This indoctrination is not just in American history class, but all classes. In Florida, only about 50% of public school students can read and do math at grade level. Florida Citizens Alliance saw this problem and decided decided to refocus their mission towards helping students in Florida get the quality education they deserve by promoting school choice, scholarships and vouchers, and parental control. Pastor Rick Stevens, the co-founder of Florida Citizens Alliance, is here to tell you more about the organization. Well, thanks so much for joining us today. We're really glad to have this opportunity to tell you a little about, bit about the Florida Citizens Alliance, what we do, where we came from, why what we do matters to you and to your students. Florida Citizens Alliance really came out of uh, some early meetings when some frustrated people gathered in a community center in Estero, Florida, and it was largely a vent session. People just let them know this is the way they felt, this is what they were upset about, how come this didn't happen, how come that happened. And so we listened a lot to each other and, and out of that came the realization that we really ought to get together and do some things because if we don't unite and work together, we can't accomplish what we care about. And so over time, we began to work on several things. And one of the things, of course, that came out of that was the whole emphasis on Common Core. And so that's a long story, but we finally accomplished some things in Florida. Now, even before that community center event took place, I was involved at our church in helping people learn about the United States Constitution. And we have had a number of times when people came through this course material and we talked about it, and it seemed to really resonate with people. As a consequence of that, I was invited to speak to a group at our library in Northwest Cape Coral. And I went there just expecting to give them a presentation on the Constitution, some of the things we had talked about. And to my surprise, somebody else was there that I hadn't met yet, his name was Keith Flaw. And that started a conversation and some involvement over a period of, of a couple of years before we ever got to the Florida Citizens Alliance. But here we were, Keith and I, in the same room with a bunch of other people who were talking about how upset they were. And so we decided we needed to put something together and, and try to pull ourselves together so we could accomplish something. And so we listened a lot. We began to write some principles down, some things we all cared about. We began to surface the issues that we cared about. And we put together some remarkable uh, foundations that helped us build from. But as it all turns out, 
it wasn't anything spectacular. The Florida Citizens Alliance is people like you, people who care about their children, who want something good to happen for them in their education, who realize that if the children don't have a chance to learn, that it makes it a huge barrier for them to have a better life. And so we started working on education because again, as I mentioned earlier, Common Core was a big, big deal. And we started to talk to the people that could change that, the people in Tallahassee. We met with senators in the Florida Senate. We met with members of the House of Representatives in Florida. Every time we talked to them, it was as though they were allergic to the whole subject. They didn't want to talk about Common Core. They didn't want to think about Common Core. That was a settled issue. We're just thinking about other things. Well, we came to realize what was going on better as we kept working at it. We changed our strategy. We continued to meet with representatives and senators. Grassroots people all across the state continued to express their concerns for their children. They just didn't feel like the children were learning what they should learn. And they could see that their students were smart. That wasn't the problem, but something wasn't connecting and they weren't learning in the way they were expecting them to learn. So we kept working on it and working on it. We developed strategies that would chip away at it. We began to un understand it better and help people understand it better. And we had had some success at that because finally the people in Tallahassee were listening and they were beginning to realize that people all across Florida really cared about this business of Common Core. In the process of that, we had some events to try to help people understand that. The very first event we had was in Naples, Florida with Dinesh D'Souza. He came and a bunch of people filled the room. We were really kind of surprised and he made a great presentation that helped people realize that education mattered. That caused us to consider some future events to help people understand what's going on. And so we planned another event and did that the following year. We wanted to help people understand education, its challenges. So we sponsored an event that featured a panel of experts and they came and joined us. One of the leading ones was Larry Arn from Hillsdale College. And they began to help us understand what was going on in education and how it mattered and what we could do about it. And, and some of the things they said were just so insightful, like Dr. Arndt said something that I've always remembered, and it really helps us know how to approach this. He said, it's not complicated to teach a student. All you need is a skilled teacher, an involved parent, and a well-disciplined child, and the children will learn. And I thought, isn't that remarkable that it's not as complicated as we make it and we really can help our children learn. But before we did another event, we were in Tallahassee in January and we met with Education Commissioner Richard Corcoran. We had met Richard Corcoran in the House when he was the Speaker of the House a couple of years earlier. And so we had followed up now that he became Florida's Education Commissioner and so we met with him in Tallahassee. We had a few things on our mind and we expected to hear from him. We knew he would listen to our concerns because he consistently had. But he surprised us in a way we couldn't have imagined. Well, just before that January meeting, Florida had had an election where we elected a new governor, Ron DeSantis. And so we thought some good things would happen in education because we had met with then candidate DeSantis and he had listened to us and seemed to understand the concerns that Floridians were expressing. But we had no expectation we were completely stunned when Commissioner Corcoran announced to us that in just a short time, the governor was gonna issue an executive order that would instruct the Department of Education to get rid of Common Core in Florida schools, to rewrite the standards that we, now call, we then called Common Core, and to put world-class standards in place to get rid of what people found so objectionable. Well, we, we were just kind of amazed by all of that because what we and other people around the state had been working for for so long was coming true in a way we never could have imagined. We expected from everything we had learned up to this point that it would require a big legislative turnover. But with the signing of one executive order that was later announced about a month later in my hometown, Cape Coral, the governor instructed that Common Core was gone and we were gonna replace it and repair, fix, improve education in Florida. Well, that changed everything and we were glad that it did. So we began to work on that. We continued to work with the commissioner. We continued to work on, on what does it mean to get rid of Common Core? How can we ensure that we have new, better standards? We found experts around the country that we connected to the Florida Department of Education. They worked together very well. And in, in that year, 
crafted the new standards that Florida is working from today. There's still work to be done. There's still materials to be written. There are still textbooks to be adopted that reflect the new standards. But there is huge, enormous hope and progress on that front. And one of the things that you may find interesting is that included in the standards that are now adopted and official in Florida are reading lists that help the students know what textbooks can tell them, but also what literature can teach them. And one of the experts that we talked to along the way and that talked subsequently to the Florida Department of Education said to us, he said, one of the ways you'll know if these standards are really good is if they include on their reading list the King James Version of the Bible. Well, that got our attention because most of the time what you hear from people is, oh, you can't have the Bible in school. You can't read the Bible. And he insisted you can read it. And he said the students must because so much of early American thought was shaped by the King James Version of the Bible. And leading politicians from presidents to others would quote from the King James Bible. So our students needed to understand it, needed to have exposure to it, needed to actually read the King James Version of the Bible. So we continued on working. We had another event uh, later that same year that featured Dan Bongino and he came and he spoke to, the, to our crowd at Naples and gave us some insights of how school choice had really helped him. And he said quite bluntly that without the opportunity for him to go to a different school, he would never have been able to to accomplish what he accomplished. He was a New York City police officer. He later was on the Secret Service for many years. Now he has one of the nation's leading podcasts. Well, during that event, we wanted to let people know that something really important had happened in Florida that people weren't aware of. In 2018, when Richard Corcoran was the Speaker of the Florida House, they worked and passed and the governor signed amazing legislation called the Hope Scholarship. When it was going through the House and through the Senate, it was popularly known as the bullying bill. And we are all aware that bullying goes on in schools. And in case you aren't aware, it's not what it used to be. It's not just kids learning to get along and having their dust ups now and then. It can be some serious things that really upset students and make school very difficult for them. Well, one of the things we wanted our audience to understand at that Dan Bongino event was something about the Hope Scholarship, its promise for students, and our concerns that people didn't know about it. So to help us make that case, now Florida Commissioner of Education, Richard Corcoran, made a video that we shared with that audience, and we want to share it with you as well. Take a look. Good evening, I'm Commissioner Richard Corcoran, but I also want to take a second to thank you guys for the great work you're doing for Hope Scholarships. Hope Scholarships were literally conceived on the, on the concept that we got to give children a hope and a chance at that world-class education and they're never going to get it when they're being physically bullied in schools and, and just and literally in many ways mentally uh, uh, tortured. And so uh, we came up with the Hope Scholarships and these go to these kids. You guys are out there on the front lines helping us find these children, grab hold of them and saying, wait a second, we got great educational opportunities for you and here's what you can do with that Hope Scholarship. And it's really amazing to think here in Florida, the third largest state and the greatest country in the history of mankind, and we have children in Florida who are being diagnosed with PTSD. The same thing that happens to our soldiers when they go over and see war-torn, um, you know, just human slaughter. Uh, it's amazing that it's happening to our school children. Um, but the Hope Scholarship is the pathway to give that hope, deliver them from that type of an environment, and give them that world-class education. And as Frederick Douglass says, we say it here all the time, an education is freedom. An education is the uplifting of the, home, the human soul to the glorious light of truth. And, and the Hope Scholarship gives those children that opportunity to, to literally lift up their soul to the glorious light of truth. And, and it's all being out there, grabbed hold of, and pushed and furthered by the great work of the Florida Citizens Alliance. Thanks, uh, Pastor Rick. Thanks, Keith, for all the great work you guys are doing. And we look forward to continuing to work for you to transform kids' lives in education. Thank you. Well, the Hope Scholarship, to give you a little bit more details, could be a model for you in whatever state you are in. It is absolutely a solution that, that works for Florida children. Uh, we'll talk to people and, and explain to them that if your child is harassed or intimidated or what we often call bullied in school, and there are a number of things the law is very specific about, 
it qualifies those students for a scholarship paid for by the state of Florida to the school of their choice. And, and people will hear us say that and, and they will look at us funny or, or they'll say something to us like, no, that can't possibly be true. Well, it is most amazing in an era when we kind of wonder if government can get anything right, they got the Hope Scholarship right. And it really is too good to be true. It is so good that it helps lift Florida students from a bad educational situation to a good one. It covers in Florida events that take place at school, at a school sponsored activity, at a school related activity, on the school bus on the way to school, or even at the school bus waiting for the bus to arrive. If a student is intimidated or harassed, threatened in any way, that automatically qualifies them for the scholarship. Well, people hear that, then they say, well, what if the school disagrees? What if I go in and talk to them and tell them this happened and they disagree with me? Well, I told you earlier that the state of Florida got this right. And this is what else they got right. Nobody but the parent has to agree that it was a bad situation. When a parent goes to a Florida school and says, my child was bullied, harassed, intimidated, they are obligated by law to fill out a report and immediately that starts the process of qualifying that student for the HOPE Scholarship. The school district has some time, they can work, that school can work to solve the problem for the parent and satisfy them, that's a good outcome. But if they don't, at the end of that 15 day period, that student qualifies for the HOPE Scholarship. The principal doesn't have to agree, the teachers don't have to agree, no one has to agree, it's the parent's responsibility to take care of their children. And when the parent said this happened and shouldn't have, that qualifies for the HOPE Scholarship. If we can help you, contact us. We can give you some more information about that and help coach you on how you might bring that to your state and help your students avoid some of these terrible situations. So the Florida Citizens Alliance foundationally cares about students. We work very hard to let parents know about the opportunities Florida makes available for them. We work very hard to identify the problems parents struggle with. And one of the things that we always want to do is we always want to remember that a solution is what makes the difference because we want to help students learn, we want to help their parents learn, and we want to be those kinds of people that provide solutions to the problems that make a difference for our schools, for our teachers, for our students. We think you want to do that too, and we hope you'll do that in your state. Florida Citizens Alliance has done such an amazing job here in Florida by removing Common Core and replacing it with best standards. As Pastor Rick said, Florida Citizens Alliance has been able to pair the Department of Education with three of the top education experts to be able to come up with better standards that will give us better outcomes. I became involved with Florida Citizens Alliance about four years ago when I started to realize what was going on in the public school system. From kindergarten into eighth grade, I was public school the whole way through. But it was high school that really started to open my eyes to the failure of the public school system. My freshman year, because my family had moved abroad, I was homeschooled. And during that year, my education flourished. It wasn't until the following two years, sophomore and junior year, when my family moved to Naples, Florida, that I realized how far ahead I was just because of that one year of homeschooling. I started to understand that there was a lot of progressivism in the public schools, but I didn't realize the history. I was taught by my parents to think critically. So I was able to look at my public school textbooks and pull what was true from what was false. And much of it was false. I remember in my US history textbook, we spent probably two chapters talking about how America is based on oppression and everything that America has done since its founding is just different forms of oppression. This is what I was taught as a junior in high school. This was in 2014 and 2015 when Common Core was really being implemented into the public schools. I remember being taken out of the classroom multiple times a week to be tested in a computer lab on various subjects. None of this testing was actually graded, it was just to get some information about the students to be able to put into a database. I remember one test in particular that struck me as very strange. I had to sit at a computer 
and listen to a woman speak gibberish into my ears and then I would type what I thought those words meant if I could come up with my own definition. So she wasn't speaking any language and what they wanted me to do was assign definitions that I had come up with to those words that she spoke. None of this makes any sense, but it was a psychological test to see how I think and how I would react. What did that have to do with my high school education? My junior year of high school, I started looking into colleges and Hillsdale College was sending me some letters. So I decided to take a road trip up with my mom and visit the school. I didn't know a lot about Hillsdale College, but as soon as I arrived on campus, their mission really struck me. I had never heard my teachers or administration talk about education the way that Hillsdale did. Dr. Larry Arn gave a speech that I still remember. He was talking about truth and pursuing liberty and critically thinking. I had never heard this kind of vocabulary used before. I was so taken by Hillsdale College that I decided I needed to move from a public school to a classical academy in order to prepare for Hillsdale College. It was the only college that I applied to and I was lucky enough to be admitted and I just graduated with a degree in economics. My senior year of high school, I went to Donahue Classical Academy in Ave Maria. As a senior, before you can graduate, you are assigned with a thesis. Part of that thesis is a long research paper and the other part is presenting it to the community of Ave Maria, anybody who would like to attend, and then do a Q&A afterwards. I decided to do my research on the past 50 years of education reform in America. This was when I really understood what was going on in the public schools. And this was when I became so thankful that I had parents who were invested in my education Many parents are sending their students to school eight hours a day from kindergarten to 12th grade, trusting that the school is teaching them academic knowledge. But they have no clue that your child is being indoctrinated to believe in anti-American values and believe that this country was never great. Not only that, but when we at Florida Citizens Alliance did a little bit of research by looking at the difference between the national test scores in Florida versus the grades that the state assigns these schools, there's a huge difference. Although many parents are told that their child is enrolled in an A graded school, Florida is actually 45th out of the 50 states in the lowest ACT scores. This is why Florida Citizens Alliance is important because many parents really don't know what's going on. Like I said, I was lucky enough that my parents were starting to wake up to the indoctrination going on in public schools just in time to pull me out and help me receive a better education. The founder of Florida Citizens Alliance, Keith Flaw, frequently asked the question, how do you get rid of a government-run monopoly? His answer is that you can't, you have to break it through competition. So here at Florida Citizens Alliance, we are focused on helping parents find alternatives to government-run schools or the public schools. Many parents don't know of the opportunities through scholarships and vouchers that are available to them and could really turn around their child's education for the better. That's why we created a new website tailored towards parents called Liberty Scholar. We invite you to check it out. I am speaking to you on behalf of my generation and generations to come. We need you to get involved and help turn American education around now. Help us by spreading the word and visit our website, goflca.com. You can also help us by liking and sharing our Facebook and Twitter pages. If we want to save this country, we need to rebuild the institutions that have been slowly eroded by progressives over the past 50 years, starting with education. Thank you.